Helen Utirati, Tina Helen Utirati, Tina Tina Rata, 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 I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to this webinar. We're here uh, meeting with um, our, our visitors from afar from the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation uh, in Yellowknife in Northwest Territories, Canada. Welcome. Welcome to everybody, especially to you, uh, Janice and Betty in Yellowknife that are connected to us from Yellowknife on Tuesday. Just like to remind everybody it's Wednesday for us and Tuesday for you. So we can give you a few heads ups on what's going to be happening in um, our portal tomorrow. Um, welcome, welcome to this discussion about Indigenous archiving. Uh, Janice Stein is the Managing Director of CBC North in, uh, in Canada and North East Territories, CBC being the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Betty Harman, Harnam manages the Indigenous Archiving Project and team within the CBC. Um, again, welcome. I'd like to open things with this question. Tell us a little bit about how the Indigenous Archiving Project spans content and interviews from not just the Northwest Territories, but all the way across to the West, to, to as far as Northern Quebec. Tell us a little bit about that geography um, to give our audience and I'll tell a little bit of context about the project. Janice, do you want to do that? Oh, we can't hear you. Oh, you can go ahead, Betty. Okay. Um, okay, well, thank you for having us. It's It's great to to meet with everybody. I wish I could see everybody, but this is this is really good. Um, we were very pleased to have Gareth come to Yellowknife. Um, he shared a lot of his knowledge with us. You're way ahead of us as far as uh, managing a collection of Indigenous stories and history and tradition. And so we got a lot of very good information from Gareth. Um, we were also able to share with him what we're doing. Um, as Gareth said, um, I think when we were chatting the other day, you said um, the farthest point to go in New Zealand takes about two hours to drive to, if I'm not mistaken. It was exaggerating um, a little bit, yeah. Okay, so we're dealing with um, about half of Canada. So I don't know if you've looked at the globe or a map or whatever, it's huge. So if we want to travel from one community to another, there are a few that have roads and you can drive the nearest community from here is an hour. The next one after that is two and a half hours. Um, we're about 1,500 kilometers north of Edmonton. So that's our first sort of big city out of here. Um, for many of the communities, especially in Nunavut or northern Quebec, to get there from Yellowknife, you have to travel um, sometimes a couple of days because there aren't always flights into every community every day. And many of these communities you can only access by air or possibly by boat in the summer or skidoo. Some people go on a snowmobile and drive there for eight hours to get from one community to another. Um, there aren't any railroads or highways or anything. So, um, so it's a huge territory. It is, and is there a lot of cultural the map, diversity? Sorry. Is there a lot of cultural diversity Sorry. within that, that, that expense? The cultural yes, we diversity. have, um, just within the Northwest Territories alone, we have 11 official languages, that includes English and French, but nine Indigenous languages. And uh, those nine languages make up about five significant different cultural groups. Um, and then when you get to Nunavut, um, it's all Inuit, so at least they have one um, one culture and one language, but many different dialects. And then Northern Quebec is Inuit, again, different dialects, but then also Cree, who live um, south of the Inuit. Uh, there are, there's one community where it's half Inuit and half Cree, um, but they're all 
very, very different cultures and they have different um, managing structures. Some are much more advanced than others. And so my job has been to make contact with them and talk about how we can share our collection um, in a culturally responsive way to make sure that we don't offend anybody by sharing any of these stories. To talk about then about the, the sharing and the rights that are associated with sharing, um, you have an audio archival collection of tens of thousands of items uh, and you're exploring the rights associated with those collections with the First Nations peoples that are connected to those materials. What are the rights issues that you are discussing with them? What are the, some of the things that CBC considers when navigating the discussions about rights with the Indigenous Nation, with the First Nations peoples? Right. Um, all of these stories have been broadcast on radio, so we don't have any um, private information or secret collections. Everything that we have that we're putting into our collection has been broadcast, and CBC does hold the broadcast rights to it, but a lot of these stories were recorded before internet came along, and so it wasn't anticipated that they would be shared on such a wide scale and that people would be able to go to any of the stories at any time, make copies and share it in any way that they wanted. And so we have brought together groups um, and I've traveled to many of the communities to meet with organizations and individuals to ask them if they have any objection to sharing the collection. Um, it's difficult for them because of course they don't know every story that's in the collection. Um, they, they probably have heard some of the stories on the radio before, but many of these stories have been stored in a basement on reel-to-reels or cassettes or mini discs for many years and nobody has heard these stories for years. So it's very exciting to get them out there and get them back to the people whose families told these stories and in some cases the, the individuals themselves who told the stories. Um, we've had very positive response. People really want the information, they really want the stories, um, but there are some stories say, you know, there has been starvation and which has re made people resort to cannibalism in some cases, um, sexual assault, residential school, murders, those sorts of things that are sensitive issues. And so when our catalogers catalog those items, they indicate that there is sensitive material in there so that people are aware before they listen to it, um, that it isn't something that you might want to share with a kindergarten class or, um, you know, with a, with a young family member, unless they're well prepared for it. Um, and they have to be understood in a cultural context like cannibalism, you know, people were starving. You live in, if you live in the Arctic, um, the resources are some few and far between, although Northern people have never ceased to amaze me with what they can find off the land. Um, but, you know, the resources at many times have become so scarce that many people starved. And um, so, you know, there, there are some stories about cannibalism. And so um, those have to be told in a very sensitive context where people understand um, what happened and what led up to that. Um, the stories about residential school, for example, people sometimes pour out their soul and they just don't want to hear it again. Um, it's, it's not something that they want to share, uh, you know, over and over again. Um, they maybe don't, don't want some of their family members or other community members to know their experiences. Really, can um, I just make a you know, note murder. that, I just wanted to make a, in, uh, so a point, uh, a, a mis, uh, I just wanted to mention that in a lot of discussions that I had with people in Yellowknife and in, uh, Saskatoon as well. The residential schools, Kopapa was really prevalent. It was really, uh, it came up a, quite commonly in conversation. So just tell us briefly about the role of residential schools and the impact that they've had uh, on First Nation peoples in Canada. You know, I'm not sure what happened in New Zealand, but I know in Australia, they would take kids away um, if they were native children or um, you know, Aboriginal children or mixed blood. Um, and um, there's that um, movie, The Rabbit Skin Fence, I believe it's called, um, about children escaping from the 
well, we would call it residential school, where they were taken away and they didn't get to see their families for years. That happened to many, many Indigenous children here. Um, many never returned. They died um, or they were, they were taken by other people. Um, and many suffered physical or even sexual abuse. And so those stories are very sensitive. And um, like I say, some people just, they don't want to share it. They, they did at a certain time in their life, but they just don't want to go through it again by listening to the stories. So it happened, I, I don't know how many, probably tens of thousands of, of Native children were taken away from their families and basically ripped out of their arms, you know, crying. Um, and then, you know, leaving communities without any children. Um, that was very, very traumatic for the older people, for the parents and grandparents who woke up in, every morning and there were no children in their communities. Um, some hid their children. They ran off into the bush or they hid them even in the oven. I heard, you know, one story of a little boy that was hidden in the oven just so that the, the priests wouldn't be able to take them away. So, so the, it's... Um, with managing the collection that you do yeah. have, the, the stories and the information that you have in your archival collection, it will have a role in connecting people to the stories of previous decades and where that disconnection has occurred through, for example, the residential school system, it's really important to discuss with the First Nations peoples how that information can be shared. You've, you, you're in discussion with leaders of First Nations, you've had uh, a meeting with them. Tell us about the logistics of calling First Nations leaders together. How do you know who to invite? Who calls the gathering? Where do you have the meeting? How do they get there? And um, yeah, tell us about the dynamics of the discussions that you've had with, with First Nations leaders and some of the logistics. We originally invited about a dozen people. Um, only about six were able to attend in the end. Um, some cancelled at the last minute, so it was very difficult. Uh, some had to travel a couple of days to come here. Um, some could drive for you know three or four hours to get here. Um, but we had we chose them because they were either political leaders and we need the political system on our side we need them to understand the value of this collection or they were chosen because they are cultural leaders so uh, you know over their over the years they have shared their own culture and language and live that kind of life so that they're preserving their their language and their culture for all the future generations and so that's how we chose them and when they, where was the meeting? How long was it for? What were some of the questions that you presented to them about the and information that you shared about the collections? We asked them if they had any concerns about sharing stories. Um, again, you know, they wanted to know, well, what exactly is in the collection? And of course, we couldn't share every story with them, but we gave them examples of some of the stories that might be sensitive. Um, for the most part, I think that they were open to having it shared online and letting anybody listen. Because the material is in the indigenous languages, the only audience we're looking at is the people that understand those languages. Um, the only other people that might be interested would be perhaps linguists who want to listen to the language and analyze it or work with the community to have a story translated and you know maybe publish something. Um, so we have said you can't use it for commercial purposes. It must be for educational purposes or, or for personal use. Um, people were, were very happy that we're getting this collection together because many of them have relatives that they haven't heard for many years. And in fact, many of these people that were at the table are recorded in the collection as well and look forward to hearing their own stories. Um, the collection is a history of of the culture, of the politics, of um, like just the whole history of the North. And so it's, it's very valuable. And I know that um, the schools are looking forward to being able to use it, um, not just to teach language, but um, also to remind people of the history, you know, where these children come from. Because the, in the North, our population is at least half Indigenous in the North. West territories in um, in Nunavut, northern Quebec, and um, in both the Inuit and the Cree communities, it's about 95%, 90 to 95% Indigenous. 
and so they really want these stories for their people so that they don't forget who they are and many of them have you know their their children and grandchildren and great grandchildren of, of people who are telling the stories um some of the people said that they would prefer that the collection for their language group be available only in their communities where the language is spoken, which of course makes sense because other groups won't be able to understand them. Um, some said that one person we had said he wanted to be the one that managed the whole collection for his language group um, to make the decisions whether people would be able to hear it or copy it. Um, that same For that same language group, the First Nation, um, their tribal organization has said, no, we would manage it and we would make it available to everybody. Um, meeting with the Cree, they have a, a very active and, um, and very well organized Cree Cultural Institute and the Cree School Board that already have um, collections. And so they look forward to adding this material to their collection. They are well prepared to take it over. Um, in Nunavut, it's harder because there are so many different organizations to try and figure out which ones should take over this collection and make it available um, is a little more difficult, partly because it's so widely spread. It's, it's spread halfway across Canada, uh, the whole northern part of Canada, you know, from the Mackenzie River all the way over to um, Baffin Island and, and northern Quebec. So it's a huge territory, many different dialects. Um, so meeting with those people is, it, I haven't done much of that. I did a little bit. Um, but I have talked with many of them on the phone and a number of organizations have expressed interest in taking over the collection and managing it. So those are decisions that we still have to make. Just to ask a question then about, for example, if there is a community that uh, is interested in receiving the uh, items in the collection that pertain to their language, what would be the dynamics of some of those communities? What's the size? Of the community, where are the people located? Uh, would it be, would there be any, how, how would you repatriate the content to that community? What, what sort of forms might that take? Um, I'm sorry, Gareth, I didn't quite get the question. <laughs> so, are the communities 20,000 people in a city somewhere? Are they villages with 300 people? What are the, 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 the local dynamics? Where would you? repatriate the content to online or in some other format? Well, um, this is a discussion we have to have still. We, at first we thought we'll make it available um, on a CBC website, um, but maybe that's not the best option. We've looked at different organizations that might be able to take it over, but many of these communities are, you know, 500 people, 300 people, a thousand. Um, I think the biggest one outside of Yellowknife is probably like Inuvik and, and Hay River. They might be what, 2,000, 3,000 people. Um, and some of these communities just don't have a facility um, to manage this sort of thing, a place where, people would be able to come in and listen at any time. There would be a staff member that would be able to assist them looking through the collection to, you know, and listening to stories, possibly making copies, um, you know, a dedicated computer that they can set aside for the public to come in. And so we're not sure, especially in those small communities, um, how it will work. Plus in these very small remote communities, Although it is improving, um, internet is not always reliable and it's very expensive. And so if we were to put it on a CBC website, um, it, would be, it could be very prohibitive for some of these small communities to have uh, you know, a computer in the library, the school library or something. Um, the cost of everybody coming in and, and listening um, just might be pro prohibitive. So, so we have a lot of a lot of uh, things to think about. Um, because CBC has a broadcasting remit and less of an archiving remit, um, what would be the dynamics of putting the some or all of the material online at the CBC website? Where would you locate it? Um, what sort of information would you provide about the, the titles, even descriptions and language? Would you use the languages themselves to describe the items? Tell us about how you, 
if you right. need a place of online, how they would hit them. So we have about a dozen catalogers who are working in all of the languages. They enter, um, it's all being, it's all digitized and it's kept in a big um, computer in Toronto. Um, I think there's a backup in Montreal too. And um, they, they listen to the stories and they enter a brief description, a very short title. Um, the description is maybe two or three sentences about what the, the topic is. Uh, they enter the names of the host and anybody that's interviewed, um, names of people that are being spoken about, the communities that are mentioned, the community of origin, the community of broadcast, and subject headings. Um, and the subject headings, we have been editing them to basically indigenize those subject headings because they, they have never been um, reviewed to include indigenous languages and cultures. And so many things like prayer songs, drum dances, tea dances, um, spirit power, those kinds of things were never in that subject um, listing. And so we've spent some time, I, myself in particular over the last couple of months, just reviewing um, all of these subjects that people have suggested. They have listed the subject, but if it's not already in the catalog, then we are going to add it. So it, it gives us, it gives people um, a much better way of accessing the information. The other thing is that we have people's names and place names, um, and there are uh, there's a variety of spelling. So you can have, I, I know one family, for example, where every member of the family spells the last name differently. Um, so slightly different spellings um, can cause problems if someone looks for one name and doesn't find it, they, they might not know the alternates. And so that's one thing that I have been doing is putting in all the alternate spellings that I can find. Um, I know the indigenous languages well enough to be able to identify um, you know, other ways of spelling certain, uh, certain names. We also have a lot of place names in the catalog that are indigenous names. Um, some of these indigenous na place names also have an English equivalent, but maybe the cataloger didn't know that and didn't enter or just didn't enter it. Um, and vice versa, many of the um, English place names have indigenous names as well, but they weren't entered. And so I spent quite a bit of time working with the catalogers and atlases that have been developed by the communities and all sorts of reports and, and different individuals, elders in particular, to try and identify if, if any of these have alternate names in the other language. So that's been very interesting for me because um, I've been around the territories for 45 years now. So I've traveled a lot and I've been to many of these places and um, it's very exciting to find out, oh, that place that I always knew as, you know, Fort St. John actually has an indigenous name or sometimes two or three indigenous names because there are, um, you know, more, there's more than one indigenous group in that area. So that's been very interesting, but it's really important to put those into the search tool because if people can't find it by the spelling that they're thinking of, um, they may not find stories at all. And of course the, um, the storytelling that is involved in, in placing indigenous names on the landscape help to make the connection and to remind us of the stories that the people of the land have, have given them and to revive to record if they aren't previously recorded audiovisually or um, audio, in, in audio format, the, the names of uh, the land. That's a really critical part of the project. I mean, let alone uh, all of the mātauranga that's being gathered in Māori. We talk about the mātauranga as our, as our Indigenous knowledge. And so the collection sounds like it's really um, imbued with Indigenous knowledge. So what's some of the Indigenous knowledge systems that are captured in some of the border or in some of the interviews and, and how can that inform what Indigenous people are doing today? There's certainly a lot about environment, animals, survival, uh, that sort of thing. How to make traditional tools, um, sleds, igloos, 
tents, how to tan hides, um, how to use every part of the animal um, for some some resource, whether it be you know a tool or clothing or um, a game or or anything. I think when you were here, Gareth, you got a chance to play a game with some seal bones, um, and you know that was that's something where other people might think, oh, the bones are not of any use, but um, Inuit in particular, or you know, all the indigenous people, they would use every single item that they had. <clears throat> I had a friend when I lived in one of the small communities, and she still had her little bag that she sometimes would wear around her neck when she went visiting, and it had seal bones in it from the seal flipper. There was a big one, a medium-sized one, and a little one, and it was, you know, mommy, daddy, and baby, and that those were her dolls when she was little and she still had them so when she went visiting she would sometimes take them with her and they would they would use little scraps of material or seal skin and make a little tent or go outside and make a little igloo in the snow and play with these little seal bones and and teach the little girls you know th this these are dolls this is how we we used to play so every part of the animal was used all of that kind of knowledge is in there um safety on the land you know about traveling especially in the spring or the fall when the ice is just um when it's melting or when it's forming you know how to know um what kind of snow is available to make an igloo um you know you have to use your knife to dig down and find out what the texture of the the snow is to find the right um the right snow to find your directions there's some stories about constellations i find that really fascinating um there are some um some indigenous constellations that now when i look up at the sky i see them um and stories about um the, you know the wind the prevailing winds will bend the trees if there, if you have trees or in the tundra it'll bend the grasses and the little shrubs in a certain direction so you can tell um, you can tell which direction you're going based on the way that the, the, the leaves or the plants are, are bent. Um, so yeah, it's, there's just so much information in there. Uh, with what's happening to the climate, of course, the knowledge that Indigenous peoples have about local climates and changes in local climate yeah. and the observations that they have is really valuable as well. I've got a question um, from the chat. This is coming from uh, Tamaki Makoto, uh, Te Whare Wānango Tamaki Makoto from Auckland University. Would you consider crowdsourcing to fill any of the information, information gaps on the collection or do you have robust information and metadata as a result of the cataloguers engaging with the content, listening to the content? I think um because the, this collection is so specific to fairly small areas, our crowdsourcing is basically getting out there and talking to people in the communities. Um, I don't know if other people, you know, from other parts of the world would be able to help us with, uh, with that. So I know Janice, perhaps you have some ideas on that, but um, I don't know that crowdsourcing, other than the way that we're doing it by getting out to the communities, emailing, talking to people, um, you know, constantly asking our catalogers to double check with people in their communities. Um, so that's the kind of crowdsourcing that we're doing at this point. I don't know, Janice, would you have any other comments about that one? No, as, as Betty says, the communication, the, the communities are such small populations. I mean, there's not that historical background. In fact, when we've talked to um, other indigenous groups across North America about issues around access to, or, or how to handle sensitive stories, they've been quite clear that what we do in with our collection is personal to our collection. And they, can, they have no advice they can give us. So I think to Betty's point that really our sources, the, the elders who live in our, our communities and the communities are so small and it's easy to reach them and actually speak with them. Thanks, Janice. Um, we've got a, a question um, from uh, one of our uh, huanga from the Waikato Nation, from Amber. I have a question about how unprovenance uh, uh, archives are dealt with. Is there an issue for when you uh, encounter titles where you are unable to identify the provenance? 
Um, well, because all of these stories um, were recorded by CBC reporters. Um, we pretty much know where they came from. Occasionally there are stories that um, they're just a story by itself. It's not in a program. And so we're not quite sure sometimes who recorded it or what the date might be. But we, we know for sure that all of these were recorded by CBC reporters. Um, and we always we can always figure out where the person is from um, just by the dialect and by checking with people listening to it and they'll say oh that's my great-grandfather or my uncle or that's you know old Joe or so and so so we don't have that problem too much Kilda. another question from Chrissy from Te Papa Tongariwa, which is our national museum uh, is there available funding from the government for this work or other cultural agencies? So how did the funding for this project come about two or three years ago? Maybe I can defer to Janice on that one. It's a very good question. Um, this content goes back to the 60s and 70s. Uh, so it's decades old and the only reason it exists is because the broadcasters themselves, the indigenous broadcasters, saved the, con the interviews and the stories in boxes under their desks. It was not part of CBC's system to actually um, record or to, to, to preserve the content in any way. In, in Canada, uh, our service, our, go our government and our CBC services are in French and English. So the, the specific languages that were done in northern Canada in particular, there was there was no ability to kind of, you know, preserve the logs for the programs or any information about the, the content of these of the indigenous languages. And so the broadcasters, because they cared and didn't want to lose the content, kept it in boxes under their desks or on shelves piled up reel to reel tapes. And in particular, Inuktitut, which is probably the key living language, apart from Cree, it's, it's the key living language in Canada. And they are very uh, committed to preserving their, their language. And so we have a tremendous amount of content in Inuktitut because the broadcasters hung on to it. They, because the whole point of their programs was to serve, from their perspective, was to serve the language and to serve their people. And over time, those broadcasters, uh, when Betty talks about oh, who's on those tapes, it's the broadcasters, they know the families, and so they, they use those, they hung on to their reel-to-reel -reel machines because they knew who the families were, and they would rebroadcast the stories over time, and they knew where to find them on the shelf, and before they would use it, they would connect with the families and ask for permission, make sure it was okay to use stories of people who had passed away. So, so no, the CBC had no, no ability or interest, I guess you could say, in preserving these languages. About three years ago, uh, because those in the North have always been aware of the, the value of this content, and CBC agreed and decided that it was important to preserve these languages and cultures. So they allocated funding within the CBC budget to digitize the content and archive it as best we could. And it's a five-year project. And um, the hope and the expectation is that over time, we will be able to link with community groups because there is a renewed interest in the whole of Canada in preserving Indigenous culture and establishing a, a new relationship with Indigenous peoples. So we're confident that there will be partnerships that develop over time that enable us to make, or a people, to make better use of the content. But the CBC commitment was a five-year commitment, um, and we're about halfway through that project now. Oh, thank you. I've got a question from... City Libraries. Um, they've made an observation that in Australia, broadcast documentaries begin with a warning that, to Indigenous communities that content may include the voices of their ancestors or their own people. So is that sort of sensitivity incorporated uh, in the way that you treat your Indigenous archival materials? Is there a cultural consideration about rebroadcasting or replaying voices from the past? For example, people that have passed on. That, 
that's that's one of the questions we're certainly asking not only our catalogers but our very experienced broadcasters <clears throat> we have some broadcasters in the station that have been there for 35 years um, so they've been at it for a long time they know what type of um, information is sensitive and if they feel in any way <clears throat> that it is sensitive or that the family might object they will call them, they'll contact them and make sure that they don't have any problem with airing it so they can rebroadcast it. Um, once it's in the collection, it will be a person's choice to go in there and, and decide to listen to stuff. So that's a little bit of a different situation because, you know, if they don't want to hear the voices again, then they don't have to. Um, for the most part, um, we're told that about sometimes six months or a year after a person passes away that you shouldn't air the stories. Um, although in some cases you might want to and so then you would contact the family and make sure that it's okay. Um, we had one of our archivers who went over and started developing some podcasts and um, so she started to um, contact family members and they were so excited. Um, she stayed on the phone with them and just played the whole recording for them because they had never heard it before or hadn't heard it since they were children. And so they were very excited. Um, I don't know that there are too many um, concerns about listening to people's voices once they've passed away. I know in um, like in East Greenland, for example, you can't even men mention a person's name after they've passed away, let alone um, listen to any of their stories or anything. It's quite a quite a different um, culture, although it's Inuit there, but it's um, they've developed many, many taboos. You can't even use the name anymore. Mm. Um, but we don't seem to be running into that too much. So I think I think we're okay. But but we do have broadcasters that are, are very sensitive to that. And like I say, in the collection, it'll be a person's choice whether they want to go in and listen or not. Thank you. Um, another question that we have is from Tamaki Makoto. Uh, what if, how do you know that the, the information presented is trustworthy? Um, if there are personal stories, how do you ensure that there's some sort of quality check about the information that you have in your collection? Um, I think because all of these stories were aired in the past, um, if there were stories where, you know, someone was slandering someone else or telling a lot of lies, um, I think the station would have received calls at that point and maybe that would have been pulled out of the collection. Yeah. Um, we do we do have some people saying, oh, that person, he's always telling stories and they're not, you know, half of them are not true. Um, if they're not, um, like I say, slanderous or, um, you know, obviously um, mean mean spirited and meaning to hurt people then um i think it's okay but you know with legends for example some of them are very fantastic and you think wow you know is that the way that the story was actually passed down but then in traditional storytelling it is up to the storyteller to embellish the story or change details as they see you know as as they see fit um they don't have to stick with the original and so some of these stories over time have evolved and we actually have examples in the collection where we have the same story but maybe three four five different versions of the same story um, so the only way we check really is you know we get comments back from people but like i say if there was anything that was really slanderous or whatever um, i'm pretty sure cbc would have heard about it and pulled it out of the collection um, there is one broadcaster in our station who has a story that she said she will never play um, she just feels that it's 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 aimed at hurting people, um, mm. and she doesn't want to play it. So so she has tucked that away somewhere. And, um, so we we do consider that, um, but then you know um, to go back and verify, you know, was such and such born at this place? Was this the correct year? Those kind of details, maybe um, we can't always verify that. Um, but we do get people calling in sometimes saying, hey, that's not so-and-so that you said it was. It's somebody else. Yeah. Um, and so we do, we, we do have those kinds of corrections made to, to uh, uh, our broadcasters. We have a question from a whānau member from the Te Aroa Nation. Uh, are the Indigenous communities happy to share their stories with non-speakers? For example, having them translated to share 
for the wider audience? Um, there are many stories that have been translated. The Department of Education has produced a lot of material based on Indigenous stories and had them translated and, and published a lot of books. Um, and for the most part, yes, I would say that they are. Um, again, we had that one um, you know, person that was at our, our leaders gathering who said he doesn't want his story shared with anybody else um, outside of his family. Um, one other person that said, I don't want anything about shamanism in the collection because I don't want people all over the world thinking that we're doing a bunch of um, voodoo up here in the Arctic, you know. Um, but everybody else in that language group has said to me, no, it's part of our culture. Some people actually still practice it. They're just, they just don't talk about it openly but it's part of our culture it's part of our history we don't want to hide it um and so some of these stories have been written about there there's so much literature um particularly about inuit where many many of these stories have been translated into english and french for the most part um probably into other languages as well german i think there was a university i was invited to at one point and they had a lot of stories that had been translated into german and so um they they are available um many of the stories are available i was in mexico one time and picked up um the the legend about the 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 mermaid that that takes care of all the animals in the sea um she has many names Nuli Ayuk and um Winnie Gumasweet Dirk and uh, Sedna. And I found a, a little children's book translated into Spanish in, in Mexico one time. So many of these stories are available. You can go online and there are, um, there are story books, there are just um, stories, and there are films also where a lot of these, um, these stories have been made into films, like the National Film Board of Canada, NFB website. Um, you can go there and there are a lot of um, stories, Indigenous stories there. I've got a question about uh, lockdown. Since Aotearoa has been in lockdown for about a month or so, I mean, personally, I have, it's shown us a lot of in insights about uh, where people live and we've shared all of our living rooms with people from right across the country. Um, how did um, the archiving project transition to lockdown or to social isolation? What, what challenges were there for the project? Janice? Well, we heard it's just as easy to work at home as it is to work in the office. <laughs> And the, uh, ar the archivers have been very, very adapted. I've been very impressed because, you know, they're not young people. They're, they're elder, verging on being elders. But I'm telling you, they know how to use computers. And so they're, they're at home doing all the work that they would be doing if they were in the office. In fact, they're working as fast as they would if, if they were still in the office. They, they have had to adapt to a few um, new bits of, of technology. Um, they have to sign in a different way. Um, and then we have one woman that lives out of town, about 30 kilometers out of town. And she has a generator for power and um, electric generator. And they don't run it all the time. And she doesn't have cell service. Um, it's spotty. She, she does have it sometimes, but not all the time. So she doesn't have internet. And so we've, um, our technical person, Trevor, whom you met, um, Gareth, um, has worked out a system where he puts it on a USB stick and brings it to her. And then she enters the details in a Google sheet. And then someone else will upload that information into the, the MAM, our, our big um, digital bank. So they've had to work around a lot of um, those kinds of things for the, they all, you know, um, all their computers were taken home for them and set up. Um, a couple of people didn't have internet and so they managed to get internet set up at home. And there's just this one person that, that has a difficult time with, um, with internet and, uh, um, you know, we're lucky because in, in some other communities, um, most people wouldn't have internet at home. And um, so it's, it's been a lot of adaptation for them. 
they've been great. We've had to go through so many different changes in this project. Um, we've got one fellow, the, the fellow that's been on the project the longest, he's been through many, many changes with us and we always call him our guinea pig because he started first. And so he went through the, the first um, model and then they realized, oh, we forgot to put in, um, you know, a column to put the geographic tag. So we don't know where these stories, the story is from, or, you know, um, we need a title as well as a description. And so he had to go back and do a lot of his stories again. And, but they've been great at about, you know, at adapting to all these changes because there have been a lot of changes. <laughs> Speaking of the but team. They're all and, and the team are all language speakers from across all of the, the the territories and the First Nations that are involved in the project. Is it um, easy to bring together a team of speakers from across all of the communities, from all of all of the languages? Are all of the languages well represented? Did you have to bring the team members in from their communities to work on the project? Um. For, we don't have somebody representing every single dialect, but a lot of these people have been interpreter translators for many years. And so they've been in meetings with people from all the different communities that speak their language. Um, and so they're familiar with, um, with the different dialects. For North Dene or North Slavey, um, we have two ladies and they each speak um, two very distinct different sub-dialects of, of their language. Um, so they have a hard time sometimes understanding each other's words. They sit beside each other or did sit beside each other, um, but they check with each other a lot um, on the meaning of certain words or how would they say it in their language if they needed to, um, to translate it. And so because of that background in interpreting and translating, being at meetings with so many different dialects, um, they're very versatile that way, but we do not, we could not possibly have um, a, a cataloger for every single different dialect, but um, they're, they're, very, uh, they're ver very good at reaching out. They call their parents, their grandparents, their aunties, uncles, brothers, sisters. They get on Facebook and ask people, they'll post a word, um, you know, they'll, they'll call the community and talk to people. Um, they, they go to each other within the station and, you know, ask, have you heard this word before? Um, so it's, it's just not possible to have somebody for every single dialect and sub-dialect and sub-sub-dialect. <laughs> but, um, but because of their experience interpreting, translating, I think they're all very, very flexible. It's been amazing. We have one, one Inuit woman that speaks all three major major different dialects. So she has worked on Inuvialuktun, Inuinaktun, and Inuktitut, which are three very, very different dialects of the Inuit language. So it's amazing how, um, yeah, it's amazing how talented they are. Bringing her multilingual skill, skill set to the project. Uh, are there sensitivities between the various uh, First Nations groups that bring challenges? Does everybody get along? Do they not get along? Are there any challenges between the groups? Um, the camaraderie when we're all together in the office is amazing. Uh, we're constantly having potlucks. Um, you experience that where everybody brings in food and they're more than willing to try something from one of the other um, cultural groups if they haven't tried it before, you know, muck duck or, or aged seal meat or walrus or um, all kinds of things that they may have never tried before. Um, so, in that respect, I think there's um, there's there's a lot of um, um, sensitivity uh, among the whole group. They themselves have been, you know, the subject of of so much um, discrimination and and uh, prejudice and stuff that I think they're all very sensitive about it. There's the odd little tiff, but I wouldn't really put it down to cultural differences, just individual differences sometimes with people working together day after day in an office and, you know, somebody says something and they, they don't take it the right way and so someone might get upset. But for the most part, there's there's really good camaraderie. And uh, I make sure I stay in touch with them every day. So I phone them or email them and I know that they're in touch with each other too. And we all meet once a week by phone 
um, so that we can all talk about what kind of problems we're having. Um, you know, with this lockdown, some of us have kids at home that we're supposed to be homeschooling. Uh, I don't sure when that's going to happen here, but um, you know, we have kids from from you know daycare all the way up to trying to finish high school. Um, one of our catalogers has a uh, daughter that's supposed to graduate this year, and uh, so she's very concerned about making sure that she gets her work done at home. Um, thank goodness she's older and she does, you know, fend for herself. But um, I've got a, a granddaughter here that's 14 and has two friends that have been basically quarantined with us for the last um, two months. And so I'm trying to get them to work, but they don't seem to be too interested. But everybody here is in the same boat. And um, so, you know, we... We try and uh, help each other and support each other, reach out, and they know that they're more than welcome to call any time to get support if they're feeling lonely or stressed or or whatever. So Thanks, it's Katie. a great group. Thank you. I've just got two quick more questions. Uh, are there any dialects that have become non-existent or on the verge of dying out that are represented on the collection? Um, there certainly are. Um, these languages have evolved over tens of thousands of years. Um, so within the Dene language group, we have five languages that are related. Um, and Gwich'in, which is in the, the north part of the Mackenzie Valley, way up by the Arctic, um, is it's the oldest version. Um, it's, it keeps the older sounds and the older word formation. Um, systems and and then you start working your way south and you get down to right around Yellowknife we have King Chong used to be called Dog Rib and it has the most speakers but it's changing the fastest so um, those people that speak Gwich'in and, and King Chong barely understand each other but the languages in between people understand a certain amount um, but many of these you know the old dialects <coughs> Um, have have gone um, or there's you know just a, a handful of speakers left even for which in language um, it's you know we have broadcasting which in language we're very lucky to be able to have somebody that's fluent enough to do the broadcasting um, because there are there are so few people that speak it and the young people are just not learning it are they tuning in They're, they're trying, yes. It's um, it, To me, it's the most difficult of all these Dene languages, just because of this, you know, it's got the older system of sounds and word building um, system in that. So it's it's the hardest of all of them to learn. And because there are just so few speakers. So having a broadcast in that language is amazing because most of these young people would never be able to hear it anywhere. They would not ever hear it at home and rarely even hear it in their community. So you even get elders that get together and they speak English um, because they were taught that it was rude to speak their language if someone else around them didn't understand. And uh, if I go to communities and I speak Inuktitut you know, to some elders, some of them will always reply to me in English, even when I ask them to speak to me in their language. And they say, well, it's not your language, so we just feel like it's rude, we shouldn't speak it. And I said, it's okay, I understand most of it and, and I'll ask you for help if I don't. Um, so there, there certainly are some languages, um, certain of the dialects that have disappeared. Um, it just, you know, it happens over time. It happens because of contact. Um, and there's a great deal of pressure uh, on these people that are trying really hard to preserve their languages teachers and you know elders and broadcasters there's so much pressure on them to um, to take on the work and um, many of them are elders now um, as Janice said most of our catalogers are elders are getting close to it they're in their 50s and 60s I'm I'm in my 70s um, and I won't say how old Janice is though and um, you know, so we have a lot of these older people who are working and there aren't young fluent speakers to come up and take their positions from them. So, so the, the chance of many of these languages being lost um, is, is very high. Just a little bit of context about the CBC building. While I was over there, there is a cataloging project on one side of the building and the rest of the building is, is actually involved in producing and, and, and 
broadcasting programs, radio and TV. So um, there are speakers of the languages on both in, in both lots of teams. I've got one quick question. With so many data sources, before we, we were running out of time, so with so many data sources and confirmation layers, how do you maintain provenance of the information sources and what metadata sets are used? So in 20 or 30 years, how will people identify the provenance of, um, of objects? And yeah, and a little bit about the, meta, the metadata sets that you use in the project. Two big questions. Is that directed to Janice? How are we gonna find this stuff and find out where it comes from um, 50 years down the road? Well, it's in, it's in the description, isn't it, Betty? It's the place and who and what program. That's as, that's as much as we can do. Uh, and the, the material actually is from 50 years ago, so the provenance has lasted that amount of time for sure. Great. Mm. And the MAM system is a new system for CBC, Media Asset Management. It's a very sophisticated system with lots of layers of knowledge in it. So that thing will, that'll last forever. Hopefully, as long as computers last and, you know, if technology changes, we'll, they'll have to adapt, you know, this collection to a new technology as they would with any other collection. Um, the originals are not being destroyed, so they're all being stored in, um, you know, in a secure, dry, temperature controlled place in Toronto. So that was one of the concerns people, um, it's one of the discussions that we've had uh, what do we do with these originals? And some people just don't want them to be destroyed because they said, you know, my grandfather's voice is on that recording. And he sat in the presence of that tape, you know, and he may have touched it. And, you know, it just thinking about the way it was recorded is, is a part of, um, of the story. And so for those, um, those items where we do have the actual box with the recording and sometimes some some writing, some scribbles even on the cover. Um, we're taking pictures of that, so that would be available as well if people wanted to look at it and say, you know, wow, this is this was created in you know 1960, uh, and maybe my grandfather wrote those words. Or so so we're trying to be sensitive about that too. We're not just planning on once we've digitized everything, then we just kind of you know. Um, Throw the throw the away. We yeah. um we would we would um discuss that in terms of the Modi or the life the life force that is imbued within the the physical items that we use to to create the content and to record the content. We've run out of time, so um look, thank you very much, um Betty and Janice for joining us. Is there anything last that you'd like to uh, any final words that you'd like to leave us with in relation to how exciting and, and, and satisfying this project has been to be a part of. Um, I just appreciate your help, Gareth. Uh, it's been great. I'm so happy that we that we touched base and that you were able to come and visit and share with us what you're doing and what you have done in the past. And, um, you know, I, I'm so grateful to see me for taking on this project. It's one of those projects that, you know, when I was interviewed, they asked me, what do you, What's, in it, what's one of the most important things about this project for you? And I said that it's really going to happen because um, I've been involved in so many, uh, you know, grant writing efforts where you apply for funding, you hope to get it, and then the project falls through because you don't get the funding. So, so this is this is terrific just to have the momentum and the the support from CBC to get this done. Um, and I hope that we'll be able to continue sharing. Um, I know that we'll be in touch on a regular basis. Just, you know. Um, Get looking for advice or um, sharing items that uh, that we get. I, I appreciate when you when you send us links to uh, you know the haka dance and that sort of thing. Our our group just loves that when when they get to see um, other cultures. So much appreciated and thank you for hosting this webinar. Thank you, Billy Janus. I would just say I'm so glad you you've been involved with this because we're babies at this. So any any learning to help us do this right because it that's really top of mind is let's do it right. Kia ora um, Look, there's a whole lot of people that are involved in this webinar as well. I'd like to do, give a shout out to everybody that has joined the webinar today. By all means, if you'd like to connect with Betty or 
um, or Janice at CBC, CBC North, uh, you know, get in touch with me or with Leanza and we can, we can help you to make those connections with them. Uh, and yeah, thank you to National Digital Forum, to Internet NZ, for, to National Library, to Leanza for, for making this happen. And again, thank you everybody for, um, for, for, for joining with us today. Nō reira nā koutou, nā koutou i oti, i mātou kato ngā mahi haumi e, hui e, tāiki e. Kia ora koutou, kā kite. Kā kite. O whiri, whiri mai, everybody's waving. Koe ana me, koe ana, basti. Nā mahi nui. Thank you so much, Gareth and Betty and Janice. That was an absolutely fantastic, really fascinating conversation. I was so pleased to be able to, to eavesdrop in on it. Um, we've recorded this session um, and we will be uploading it to the Lianza uh, YouTube channel. It um, uh, should be up there early next week. Um, this is the, the final um, webinar, in, webinar in the series of three that Gareth's presented and Gareth you've just done an amazing job it's just a really wonderful resource that we're going to have up for people to be able to um, use and share um, and I'm sure it will be an ongoing resource for people so um, namahi nui thank you once more bye everybody okay bye thank you